It's common now to see ACH listed as a payment option, but that does not mean everyone fully understands all the nuances and the ins and outs of how it works. Make sure you stick around until the end when we share one common misunderstanding about ACH that every accounting, finance, accounts payable, and treasury professional needs to be clear about. It will definitely impact how you make payments and what those payments will cost. Let's start you off by answering the question, what is an ACH transaction? An ACH transaction is a bank or credit union electronic payment transaction. The funds are taken from one bank account and moved into another, either at the same financial institution or a different one. The accounts in question can belong either to individuals like you and me or companies. And I use the word companies very broadly to encompass any organization that is not an individual. Basically, the transactions can be between any entities that have bank accounts. ACH transactions can occur in two basic forms, as a credit transaction or a debit transaction. Unsurprisingly, at least to me, they are referred to as ACH credits and ACH debit. As we've already implied, payments can be B2B, i.e. business to business, B2C, business to consumer, C to B, consumer to business, or C to C, consumer to consumer. Let's start with an explanation of the ACH payment type referred to as ACH credit. This transaction is initiated by the payor. The funds are taken from the payor's account and deposited into the payee's account. If you are receiving, receiving direct deposit or payroll, you're receiving an ACH credit in all likelihood. This is a prime example of a B to C payment. This is the type of payment that most of us are familiar with. The US government is a big proponent of ACH and also makes most social security payments using this mechanism. In the recent years, the business community has embraced ACH payments and many organizations are now using ACH credits to pay suppliers in addition to their employees. Paying suppliers using ACH is an example of a B2B payment. This seems pretty straightforward. Let's think a moment about fraud and more importantly, fraud protection when it comes to ACH payments. At first glance, it seems like there can't be any frauds associated with this type of payment. But sadly, that is not completely true. Criminals have figured out if they could take over someone's computer and capture the keystrokes using key logging software, they could steal the user ID and passwords of the persons responsible for setting up and releasing ACH credit transactions. And this is what they've done. This is part of the reason fraud protection experts make such a big deal about not clicking on a link or downloading an attachment from an unknown source. It is also why I strongly advocate using a separate computer for all online backing activity. If you never get an email, or surf the internet on a particular in computer, your chances of downloading that awful key logging software that causes all the problems are as close to zero as possible. I don't want to tempt fate by saying it's impossible. Likewise, it is now an accounts payable best practice as well as a treasury best practice that someone do daily bank reconciliations to determine if there are any unauthorized transactions against your accounts. If there are, get in touch with your bank immediately. There is one other simple way to protect against an unauthorized ACH payment being initiated against your account. Put an ACH block on the account. This will not permit any ACH activity to be initiated against the account. Misconceptions about ACH fraud. Sometimes when a fraud occurs, the victim will say, I don't understand. I never gave permission for this type of transaction. Doesn't the bank check? The answer is no. The bank does not verify that you gave permission for the transaction. Before we turn our attention to the second type of ACH payments, I'd like to request that if you are getting any value out of this, and of course I hope you are, you hit the like or the thumbs up button to let us know so that the information can be shared with more people and I should make more videos like this. A big thank you from me to all of those who've done this. The second ACH payment type is an ACH debit. This is not something most Americans are familiar with or comfortable with, although we're getting there. It is, however, fairly common in a good part of the rest of the world. In a few moments, you'll see why some consumers love ACH debits. With this type of arrangement, the entity getting paid, i.e. the payee, debits the account of the payor for the amount owed. 
The most common example of this might be if you let your mortgage lender debit your account each month for your mortgage payment, your monthly mortgage payment. This would be a C to B payment as it would be if you made such arrangements with your utility. If you're like me and like to time those big payments so they get made at the last minute just in time to avoid late fees while simultaneously allowing you to keep the money in your bank account until that last possible moment, you know that occasionally you forget and then you end up getting hit with that horrible late fee and possibly interest charges. If, on the other hand, you had allowed the bank to automatically debit your account, your bank account, this anguished moment could be avoided. This payment mechanism is also used to a small degree in the business world. I'm sure it won't surprise you to learn that many organizations are reluctant to allow this. When I mentioned this type of payment to my boss a number of years ago, that this approach, this payment approach, was being used at an affiliate of ours in another country, she was immediately intrigued. Call the bank, she said, and see if they can arrange for us to do that. When I asked her if we would allow anybody to debit our bank account, she snapped at me. Don't be ridiculous. Then why, I asked, do you think our tenant, who were all Fortune 500 type companies, would allow this? It didn't take her long to recognize that ACH debits were not going to work for us at that time. Not much has changed in the 30 years since we had that conversation, but there have been some cracks. Much of the ACH debit activity still remains in the consumer space, but not all of it. ACH debits are used in some states to pay sales and use tax and in some close corporate relationships. As you're listening to me, you probably realize that ACH debits are rife with opportunity for fraud and you are correct. So every organization must protect themselves. The excuse, but we don't make ACH payments, so we don't have to worry about this, is a delusion. Sorry to be so harsh. The first ACH frauds involved crafty criminals, almost always operating, by the way, in another country, initiating ACH debit in cases where a check fraud had failed due to the use of positive pay to protect against check fraud. That's right. If you purchase positive pay to protect yourself against check fraud, that's all you've done protect yourself against check fraud. It doesn't extend past that, unfortunately. Remember, it's up to you to protect yourself. It's not the bank's job. So this is just one more very good reason to do daily bank reconciliation. While individuals have a longer period, anyone who is not an individual has only 48 hours to notify the bank of an unauthorized transaction and have it re reversed. Now, this does not mean if you find it after 48 hours, you should notify the bank. You should, and they, in all likelihood, will do their very best to get your money back. You no longer have that guarantee as you waited too long. Additionally, if you don't want any ACH debits initiated against your account, you can put an ACH debit block on it, and everyone should. Regularly talk to your bank to find out what new frauds are out there and what you need to do to protect your organization. Sometimes just knowing about a fraud is, that's going on will help you recognize it. So share the knowledge. Who to share this information about new frauds brings up the issue of who handles ACH payments. In general, payments are made in the accounts payable department as part of invoice processing. When the invoice is processed, approved, and scheduled for payment. Traditionally, a check was, was issued. That tedious process is handled in accounts payable, but when it comes to paying with wire transfers, that's sometimes a different story. In a good portion of companies, wires are handled in treasury or elsewhere in accounting, sometimes in accounts payable. So when paying supplies with ACH became a real thing, responsibility for making those ACH payments sometimes went to the folks responsible for the other electronic payments, the wire transfers. This in and of itself is not an issue, as long as the folks making the ACH payments follow the same standardized and very strict procedures used when paying otherwise. For if they don't, the chances of a duplicate payment and or fraud skyrocket. If your organization is one where ACH payments are made outside accounts payable, perhaps it is time to reevaluate that situation. For as the number of checks decrease, and ACH's increase, it might be time to move that to accounts payable. Which brings us to another big misconception, or perhaps I should say, lack of understanding around ACH's. They are absolutely not the same as wire transfers. Yes, both are electronic payments, but that's where the similarity ends. 
we think understanding the differences between these two types of electronic payments is so important. We did a short talk on it, which you can watch right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description.